Okay, well, uh, let's just get started. Uh, thank you all for being with us today and welcome to our June webinar. We are very excited to share with you um, our next generation immunodeficient mouse models, which are suitable for several applications, including human derived cell or tissue engraftment. Um, but before I get started, I would just like to introduce myself and our expert panelists. Uh, I'm Rebecca Soto and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I have a PhD in biological and biomedical sciences. My primary role at Biosciogen is to develop scientific content. Um, I'm joined today by our speaker, Dr. John Charpentier. Uh, John earned a PhD in immunology and has nearly 10 years experience uh, studying aspects of T-cell biology. Um, and in his current role at Biocytogen, he serves as a business development manager where he liaises between Biocytogen's clients and scientific teams to ensure collabor collaboration success. Uh, we are also joined by Dr. James Jin, Vice President of Biocytogen Boston. James' prior research experience spans several fields, including virology, immunology, proteomics, protein structure, stem cell biology, and genetically engineered animal models. So with that, um, I'd just like to welcome our speaker and panelists. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end, so please stay tuned. And now I would like to invite John to begin his presentation. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, and, and thank you everybody for joining. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and you can tell me uh, if, if you can see it all right. Oops, looks like I gotta go into presenter view. All right, how is that looking for everybody, good? Good. Excellent. All right. Well, like Rebecca said, um, I have a background in immunology and, and speaking about immunodeficient uh, mouse models for research is, is, uh, is one of my passions and, and, and areas of intense interest. So it's really my pleasure to talk with you guys uh, about the exciting work Biocytogen is doing in this area. Uh, so a bit of background about biocytogen. Uh, as a preclinical CRO um, that, that is also involved in, in many aspects of therapeutic development, we aim to be sort of a one-stop shop CRO for preclinical researchers. That's everything from target identification all the way through to uh, clinical trials and, and IND applications. Um, uh, so, you know, much more. We're much more than a genetic engineering company. Um, even though today we're going to focus really just on these immunodeficient mouse models, we'd be happy to talk with you about any of these other areas, and we can uh, bring that up in the Q and A as well. So, what we're going to cover in this webinar, I'll give you a brief roadmap. Uh, first, we're going to look at the question of why do we use uh, immunodeficient mouse models. Uh, next, we'll go into a little bit of the history on these models, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, then I'll introduce the BNDG mouse model um, and, and show you some data from experiments uh, 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 involving th this model. Then we'll move on to discussing the next generation uh, BNDG-derived models. So these are models that have BNDG as a background immunodeficient strain, but also have human genes knocked in or additional genes knocked out. At the end of that, we'll we'll discuss uh, just some basic logistics and practical information about ordering mice from Biocytogen. And then after that, we'll do a, a brief Q&A if, if there's time. So why use immunodeficient mouse models? Well, I'm sure many of you on this call are going to be familiar with this quote uh, that you encountered at some point in your training. Um, and this is the, the, the aphorism, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that comes to us by way of the British statistician, uh, one of the great Bayesian statisticians of the 20th century, George Box. And I think that's a really apropos quote um, to, to introduce uh, our discussion of immunodeficient mouse models. So why would we use these models? Well, for one, they open up the possibility of xenotransplantation of human cells and tissues, as well as cells from, from other um, species. Uh, the use of immunodeficient mouse models enables the reconstitution of hu human immune system components in vivo in the mouse, uh, making it a more uh, human-like uh, uh, model system to work in. Uh, the use of immunodeficient mouse models enables the study of human-specific pathogens that would otherwise not be um, able to be studied in, in vivo in the mouse. Uh, importantly for the R&D, uh, the industrial R&D that, that many of you may be engaged in, uh, the use of immunodeficient mouse models enables phenotypic and functional characterization of human tumors, uh, be they cell-derived uh, xenografts or uh, patient-derived xenografts. Uh, um, the, the, the immunodeficient mouse model system enables the study of them in vivo. We can also do in vivo embryonic stem cell and induced pluripotent stem cell studies um, in, in this system. 
and as I alluded to before, we can test candidate therapeutics in vivo uh, while recapitulating relevant aspects of human biology. So while it may not be a perfect representation of human biology, uh, it, we're, we're, we're moving further on the continuum into uh, in, in that direction. So that brings me to our, our first quiz question for your involvement. Uh, Stone, if we could bring up that question. And that is, what was the first immunodeficient mouse uh, that was characterized and what is it called? Um, so when was it and, and, and what do we know it as? I guess we'll go ahead and put that question up. There we go. So we've got as answers, 1962, the nude mouse, 1961, the Nodge GLTJ mouse, 65, the skid mouse, uh, or 73, the, the IL-2 R gamma null mouse. Which one do you think was first? Really kind of set us on the path of, of, uh, of discovery in this direction. Give it a couple more seconds, maybe get a little bit more participation. All right, I guess I'll call it good there. And it looks like we got, uh, well, we're still getting a few in. Uh, looks like most of you have got it, not surprising, a very educated audience. The uh, the first was uh, the the 1962 uh, athymic uh, nude mouse, um, and this was a mouse that had a spontaneous mutation, um, uh, actually deletion in the uh, master regulator of thymic epithelial cells, uh, FOXN1. So uh, uh, this this transcription factor is critical for thymic organogenesis, and therefore limp. limp uh, thymph thymocyte development, and therefore T-cell development after that. So this was uh, just noticed in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a mouse that was under study. It was spontaneous deletion. These mice lack a thymus and lack mature T-cells, and this was the first immunodeficient mouse model. Um, after that was, it was some time before there were advances in this field, um, and this uh, next advance came in the early 80s in Japan with the uh, non-obese diabetic or Nod mouse, uh, Nod Shi LTJ mouse as we alluded to before. Now this mouse uh, was, was an advance in immunodeficient uh, models because it has a polymorphism in CTLA-4, the checkpoint protein. It leads to uh, improper slice, uh, splicing of CTLA-4, um, which leads to derepression of T cell responses, pancreatic islet, cell infl uh, islet infiltration, and as a result, and as the name suggests, these mice develop type 1 diabetes. Interestingly, these mice also lack uh, the C5 hemolytic complement component, so they uh, are deficient in circulating complement. And uh, as we'll get into a little bit later in the discussion, they possess a polymorphic SERP alpha allele. That This was only understood in, 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 in the decades following. Um, but this polymorphism uh, leads to the SERP alpha allele, the murine SERP alpha allele, uh, to recognize human CD47 with, um, with great affinity. Um, and that makes for a more permissive uh, xenografting environment. Uh, next up was the skid mouse in 1985. This had a mutation in the protein kinase DNA activated catalytic subcomponent, uh, component, but clumsily named known as uh, P PRKDC. Um, and this leads to impaired VDJ recombination. Um, this uh, enzyme repairs uh, double strand breaks that occur in many settings, um, but also, uh, and importantly for this purpose, in VDJ recombination. Uh, skid mice are also sometimes referred to uh, uh, or also classified as skid mice if they possess a RAG1 or 2 mutation or deletions, um, but for the most part, we're talking about PRKDC uh, mutation that is carried on, you know, congenically into future uh, immunodeficient strains. What this results in as a, as a result of impaired VDJ recombination is non-functional T and B cells and A gamma globulinemia, <clears throat> which is to say uh, a defect in producing antibodies. Uh, on, uh, something to remember about the, the, these, this model, the SCID model, is that um, high numbers of NK cells are still present, and this is a major drawback of, of the use of this. Uh, next up was the Nod Skid Mouse, which took, as you might expect from reading the name, it resulted from crossing uh, the, the Skid Mouse um, with the, uh, the, the Nod uh, ShiLTJ uh, so that it possesses both a mutation of CTLA4 or a splicing in, uh, defective splice variant of CTLA4 and a defective mutation in PRKDC. As a result, there are huge defects in this model of innate and adaptive immunity, plus a permissive grafting environment for the reasons we just talked about. 
Uh, and then in 1997, um, the next major advance was the IL-2 R gamma null mouse. This has a null allele of the IL-2 receptor common gamma chain, which if you know your immunology, that means um, a, a defect in cytokine signaling across a, a wide variety of different um, cytokines, including IL-2, 4, 7, 9, many of which are important for the ontogeny of uh, lymphoid and myeloid cells. Uh, and for the first time in these model systems, we see a, a pronounced NK cell deficiency because of that um, lack of IL-15 uh, in, in development. Then in 2002, probably the model that most of you are familiar with, um, uh, uh, the Jackson variety is called Nodskid Gamma, NSG, um, but also a similar uh, model, a model is the, is the Nog mouse. This is in 2002. It possesses deficiencies in CTLA-4, P PRKDC, and the IL-2R gamma common chain. Uh, common chain. Um, and as a result, they have defective TB NK cells complement. And this is a severely, severely immunodeficient mouse and was considered sort of the standard in the field uh, prior to uh, uh, the uh, biocytogen uh, uh, NDG mass. Um, and so I'll briefly now just talk about, as I alluded to before in some discussion of the, of the history, there are serious limitations to these existing models. Uh, one of them is that phenotypic penetrance uh, varies considerably from, from model to model. Uh, there is some leakiness of, of uh, murine uh, immune cell uh, leakage. Uh, and as a result, you'll sometimes see immune cell reactivation uh, of, of, of mouse immune cells, especially as the, as the mice age. Uh, even though they, uh, the, some characteristics of these mice uh, allow for a permissive engrafting environment, um, we're still talking about pretty low odds of success. So there's, there's a possibility for, for grafts, uh, and it really depends on what you're trying to do with them and which model you're using, but there's often poor engraftment uh, and proliferation of the xenotransplanted cells and tissues. Uh, in addition to that, they often have aberrant function. Um, so in other words, uh, you may see impaired antibody responses and absence of class switching and other uh, functional readouts of the immune system that you'd hope to see from, from the, immune, the human immune cells. Um, and these cells also have reduced, or these models also show reduced longevity, uh, some of them quite severe. Uh, so that brings me to our second poll question. Uh, number two. Oops, sorry. So I got the same one here. Question two, here we go. What kind of tumors uh, appear spontaneously in some of the early immunodeficient models that really limits their use? They have reduced longevity um, as a result of uh, spontaneous tumors. And, and, and what are those? So the choices are hepatomas, uh, plasma cell neoplasms, uh, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, or thymic lymphoma. It's a reproducible uh, attribute of especially the nod skid mice uh, and congenic strains derived from that. Looks like we got some good participation. I'll let it go for a few more seconds here. All right, I think that's that's good. The people who are going to answer are going to answer. And yes, again, a very educated audience. Uh, the uh, type of tumor that spontaneously appears uh, in these mice is uh, thymic lymphomas um, uh, at, at a very high rate that, that limits their longevity. So great, great job on that. And that brings me to the BNDG mouse model, what we're here to talk about uh, today and the derived lines from it. So, you know, there's the, the, the factual information that you need to know about this mice, uh, this, this mouse rather. Uh, there's the strain name, which uh, if, you, if you're adept at reading uh, mouse strain names, you can sort of see the relevant mutations and background. Uh, the background is broadly speaking a nod skid background. And there you see the genotypes uh, that are, that are um, sexually dimorphic. These mice exhibit a longer lifespan than um, nod skid mice, for example. So uh, these mice can live as long as one and a half years uh, versus eight to nine months, typically, uh, due to the appearance of those thymic lymphomas in nod skid mice. There's minimal incidence of those lymphomas, as well as minimal to absent uh, lymphocyte leakage uh, in the BNDG model. Uh, I would say just basically absent uh, uh, murine IgG and IgM in the serum. I'll show you some data related to that momentarily. Uh, and there's minimal to absent rejection of human cells and tissues that really makes this the, the best immunodeficient model on the market right now, um, leading to more efficient CDX and PDX engraftment, save time, save money, quicker answers in your research. We see that when uh, we look at uh, the body weight between a uh, wild type C57 black 6J uh, and our BNDG mouse, that these are nearly identical um, uh, over time. 
we see that the BNDG mice exhibit, as I said before, a significantly reduced serum antibody response. So you see some ELISAs here uh, performed using serum from BALBC and BNDG mice, and they have dramatically reduced circulating IgG and IgM in the BNDG mice. Uh, compared to the wild type positive uh, and blank negative controls. In fact, as you can see in the, the on the right side with the IgG subclasses there, I mean, it's virtually indistinguishable from the negative control blank used in the experiment. So just a really pronounced uh, uh, defect in, um, in antibody responses. But as expected from the mutations that they carry in the history that we just walked through, uh, the BNDG mice lack uh, B, T, and N, K cells. So here you're seeing um, splenocytes isolated from BALB-C, NOD-SCID, and BNDG mice on the left that are about six weeks old. Um, and they, after gating on single live cells in the murine CD45 positive population, you see that um, there is just a, a, a severe lack, a severe deficiency uh, in the BNDG mice uh, of NK, B, and T cells, uh, even compared to a highly deficient model like the NOD-SCID. And then on the right, you see the percentage of murine BT and NK cells in each of these strains. Um, and once again, the BNDG mice, when you quantitate it, just have a, a severe defect where they do not produce uh, murine uh, BT and NK cells, making them a really useful model system. Uh, now, when we look at the structure of lymphoid follicles, what we'd expect to see, is, and as you see in the C57 on the left, um, is that nine-week-old females here, uh, if you take split splenic sections, you see really well-defined lymphoid follicles uh, with all the expected morphology. In the nod skid mice, uh, you see some defects in that morphology and structure, but also white pulp hypoplasia, um, and, and it's you know progressively more disorganized. By the time you get to the BNDG mouse, when we look at sections from that, you see a total total loss of follicular organization and structure, um, which is consistent with it being a more highly immunodeficient mouse uh, than the nod skid and other models. Now, this high degree of immunodeficiency uh, makes it a really superior model, the BNDG mouse, uh, for CDX uh, builds. Um, and so here we're looking at a you know, comparison between BALB-C nude mice, so athymic ath ath BALB-C mice, uh, and nod skid mice, both of which are highly immunodeficient. Um, but if you perform a Raji B-cell uh, CDX graph, this is a uh, uh, Burkitt's lymphoma that came from an 11-year-old child, um, and you uh, uh, inject these cells into these different uh, mouse strains and follow their survival, well, what you see is that the BNDG mouse uh, dies first, um, and that's because it is more immunodeficient and the tumor is uh, more aggressive and the tumor burden higher in that in that mouse uh, compared to the nod-skid mouse and certainly to the BALB-C mouse, which has uh, some uh, residual immune system that, that, that can um, exhibit anti-tumor activity. Um, you also see a decline in body weight in the central panel for the BNDG mice that's um, much more rapid uh, than even the highly immunodeficient nod skid or the BALB C nude. Um, and then the proportion of human cells, interestingly, but as expected, uh, in the BNDG mice uh, is, is significantly higher um, post-tumor inoculation um, uh, in, in peripheral blood in the BNDG mice versus the nod skid. And this can just even be seen um, without much effort by, by gross anatomical inspection. So here you're seeing a comparison of liver uh, from uh, the nod skid mice and uh, BNDG mice who have been uh, infused with Raji B cells. And the experiments were stopped. The reason why the dates are the days are different there is because the experiments were stopped after the, uh, the mice lose 20% of their inoculation day body weight. But just gross inspection at 18 days already in the BNDG mice, uh, you can see uh, 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 tumor metastases and, and and just gross uh, appearance of tumors uh, by, by the naked eye. Um, similarly, uh, if you perform uh, uh, sections and, 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 and uh, take images uh, of liver and spleen at the same time, you can also see uh, uh, neoplasia that is uh, much more excessive in these organs in the BNDG mice versus the nod skid. Now, uh, the BNDG mice also, as I said at the top of the talk, uh, are a great system for PDX model builds. So these are patient-derived xenografts. Uh, these are uh, tumor cells engrafted onto our highly immunodeficient mice. And you can see just from this summary, this is the number of respective uh, of, uh, PDX model builds that have been performed with our BNDG mice already, uh, with the majority of them being gastric, but a wide variety of, of other uh, PDX uh, uh, organs uh, involved. Uh, but in addition, to CDX and PDX studies uh, with BNDG mice, they're extremely well suited for CAR T and uh, CAR NK cell uh, studies. So here I'm going to show I'm showing you some um, 
uh, results from another BNDG, this is fire, firefly luciferase emitting Raji B cell CDX, uh, in which 5 million of these Raji cells were transplanted into eight BNDG mice, uh, and then followed by infusion of 20 million HCD19, uh, human CD19 targeting CAR T cells two weeks later. And the point here really is just that the controlled mice show uncontrolled uh, 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 tumor burden and, and growth, uh, whereas the mice receiving CAR T infusions exhibit partial to near complete responses and a huge reduction in tumor burden as measured by BLI. So a great system for that. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about with these mice is uh, the, the exciting possibility we alluded to before of a human immune system reconstitution using the BNDG mice. Um, and so uh, this is one of the great uh, 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 advances made possible by uh, immunodeficient mouse models. And it's typically done with either human peripheral blood mononuclear cells or with CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells from, from, from humans. Um, and th this engraftment is, is permissive in the BNDG mouse. Uh, on the left side here, we're showing you, uh, so human PBMC cells transplanted into the mouse um, uh, first gating on uh, uh, murine CD45, and then looking at the identity of these cells uh, with a human CD45 marker, we see that there is just a, an absolute abundance of human CD3 positive T cells in these mice 24 days post engraftment, which is quite impressive. Um, on the right, we see CD34 uh, positive uh, HSC engraftment, and 10 weeks post engraftment uh, with these cells, we see that there are just large proportions uh, on the right quantitated where the percentage of lymphocytes are human T, B, and NK cells uh, as, as late as 10 weeks post engraftment, which is really a testament to how, how great this model system is for human immune reconstitution. Show you a little bit more about uh, the identity of these cells in a similar experiment um, following PBMC reconstitution in the BNDG mouse. And this is after 5 million human, human PBMCs were intravenously transplanted into female mice. Um, and in, uh, our analysis reveals a really high percentage of human CD45 positive cells. Uh, reduced body weight and shortened sur survival is, is also a part, uh, 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 also a pattern that we see. Um, but this is likely due to graft versus host effects. Um, and uh, the, the activity of these human immune cells. So sort of paradoxically uh, negatively impacting survival because of such successful engraftment. Um, and here you see that the, the T cells uh, that are a, a proportion of uh, the human CD45 uh, cells is nearly 100%. Um, we see CD4 uh, and CD8 differentiation, you know, 10 weeks afterwards, just a really great model system for this. And we don't just wanna reconstitute the immune system in these, in these uh, mice, we want to test therapeutics, right? So here's a, a panel from an in vivo efficacy study using uh, CD20 targeting uh, rituximab, human CD20 uh, targeting rituximab, uh, and a bispecific antibody in this BNDG CDX model of luciferase Raji cells. Um, and so we see that when you infuse the Raji cells, the PBMCs, and these antibodies intravenously into the BNDG mice, and then monitor uh, the tumor growth uh, and body weight over time uh, post-infusion, uh, we can see that this is a, a great example for, uh, uh, for, for testing these antibodies, these human-directed antibodies, in a human-emulating system inside this mouse model. It's just a really a powerful demonstration. And we see that the bispecific that targets uh, more than one human target uh, is the most effective at constraining tumor growth um, with minimal changes in body weight as well. So a great system for testing human-directed antibodies uh, in a human uh, reconstituted uh, immune system within the mouse, uh, made possible by the BNDG mice. So this brings me to the next generation BNDG models, which are you know, the, the next iteration uh, where we complement this BNDG background by also knocking out additional genes uh, or knocking in human genes uh, for, for some uh, useful research or therapeutic purpose. Um, and the first one I want to talk about is the BNDG human IL-6 model. Uh, and this really solves uh, uh, the problem that you may have noticed on the previous slides of, of, of B cell deficiencies in the BNDG background. Uh, we see T cells proliferate and differentiate uh, just fine and survive for a really long time. Um, but we don't see a, a similar response from, uh, from, from B cells. Um, and that's because of, again, that, that common gamma chain defect that impairs cytokine signaling. Um, so as a result, if you express human IL-6 uh, within this model system, um, uh, you see enhanced human B cell and plasma cell differentiation and expansion. 
So it solves one of the major uh, uh, problems that, that's that's seen in the use of these models, including the most recent, you know, NSG and, and NOG models. Uh, similarly, if you express uh, human IL-15 in the BMDG background, we see enhanced lymphoid cell differentiation and expansion. So that includes NK cells, NK T cells, and CD8 T cells that differentiate, expand, and survive longer because of the uh, expression of human IL-15 on this background. Similarly, if we express uh, the duly humanized uh, CSF1 and human thrombopoietin uh, uh, in the BMDG model system, we can enhance human monocyte and macrophage differentiation and expansion. Um, it should be noted that in the in the NSG, NOG, and other uh, uh, models, uh, that there are, are is really poor myeloid uh, cell differentiation as well because of an absence of of, of the human varieties uh, of these of these factors, um, growth factors, and so. Um, um, the last one that I that I have on here is the BNDG HLA A2. So this is expressing uh, a human MHC HLA um, that includes the human beta two microglobulin, um, and as a result of that, these mice are highly immunodeficient, but show enhanced human CD8 T cell differentiation as before and expansion, with the added advantage of recognizing HLA-restricted epitopes. So T cells that uh, develop and differentiate in these mice uh, can recognize HLA-restricted epitopes, which is extremely important uh, for, for human-directed uh, therapies. Um, and and uh, model systems like this in which uh, HLA-A2 is, is co-expressed um, uh, have been very successful for, for, for accelerating uh, the development of HLA-restricted uh, uh, epitope vaccines um, and other therapies. So that's another really exciting model. But back to the uh, human IL-15 uh, 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 next generation model, I just wanted to show you some data uh, because it's so important that the, uh, that the human lymphoid cell problem, this deficiency that we see in the use of other other common uh, immunodeficient models that this is solved by, by this expression of human IL-15. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is that NK cells can maintain a, a very high reconstitution level uh, many weeks after injection. And you're seeing uh, in the red dots there, uh, the, the, the count uh, per microliter um, po days post-injection compared to just the BNDG background. So this is a head-to-head -head comparison. Um, and so the proportion of NK cells uh, after sorting was as high as 80%. Um, and two weeks post -re reconstitution, uh, that, that high level was, was maintained, uh, which you can see on, on the right there. So a really exciting next generation model that solves one of the problems with, with earlier models. Another possibility, uh, in addition to expressing um, human genes alongside uh, or in the background of this BNDG mouse, um, another possibility is to uh, knock out murine genes or mutate them uh, so that they just don't exhibit whatever negative effect they do um, in the system that might confound your research. Uh, one example of this is the BNDG beta-2 microglobulin knockout plus model. So this is a second generation model in which there's an absence of MHC1, murine MHC1, and CD8 T cells. Um, and this is great for studying, uh, you know, for being a model system in which you can um, study uh, your, your problem against a background of deficient CD8 T cell responses that may otherwise be interfering with interpretation um, in, the, in the system. Another one is the BNDG uh, kit WV. Uh, this is a mutation of the kit proto-oncogene RTK, also known as C-kit. Um, and this is a critical factor for the structuring of bone marrow to enable proper niche development. So if we uh, knock out uh, or mutate uh, the, the murine version of kit, it allows graphs of, hu of human hematopoietic stem cells um, to, to uh, develop in proper bone marrow niches critically without the need for radiation preconditioning. So the standard protocol if you're if you're if you're uh, trying to repopulate a, 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 you know and, and, and reconstitute a human immune system and allow for proper myelopoiesis and erythropoiesis, you know competing against that mirror these murine cells and factors that are also trying to establish their own niche uh, niche, you don't need to um, irradiate the animals beforehand, which might have untoward effects. Uh, you can just knock out C kit murine C kit and it enables easier engrafting of human uh, hematopoietic stem cells. It's a really, really exciting and novel uh, model. 
Another possibility is to, to take the BNDG mice and combine both human transgene expression um, with murine gene knockouts. Um, an example of that is the BNDG beta-2 microglobulin knockout plus combined with the human IL-15. Uh, so this combined this is the best of both worlds. You have an absence of murine MHC1 and CD8 T cells, but these mice also exhibit enhanced human NK cell proliferation and expansion. Um, and then one of the other models I really want to zoom in on, um, because it's one of our most popular and it's a really hot area of research right now, um, is the BNDG human SERP alpha human CD47 uh, model system. And for those who don't know about this uh, signaling axis, this is an inhibitory signaling axis that functions as a sort of don't eat me signal uh, to enable cell survival. And if you co-express human SERP alpha um, with human CD47 uh, in the background of the BNDG mouse, uh, you can get uh, potentially enhanced uh, engraftment uh, because uh, 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 um, human cells that express human CD47 uh, as a ligand interact with the human SERP alpha inhibitory receptor and that uh, 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 inhibits macrophage uh, ph phagocytosis of human cells, leading logically to their enhanced survival. Um, and so to show you some data from that, um, Human SERP alpha in this system uh, is, is uh, really just uh, exclusively detected in the homozygous BNDG uh, double humanized mice, but not in the BNDG background, as you can see, or in wild type. Um, and so uh, this is a, a, a great demonstration uh, that, that the murine SERP alpha is, is silenced and the human SERP alpha uh, is expressed uh, in, in this system. And then additionally, uh, as you'd expect, there's species-specific CD47 expression uh, in these mice. Um, so this is just, again, representative flow plots. That And the point, the real take home here is that in the duly humanized immunodeficient mouse compared to just the BNDG background or a wild type mouse, um, you detect only human SERP alpha and uh, human CD47, or I shouldn't say only, but broadly and, and mostly. Um, very, very efficient knockout of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, murine axis, but but preserving the human axis and interaction, and potentially you know more accurately recapitulating um, uh, the interaction of the graft with myeloid cells and other cells that may target it. This is also a great system for um, studying the effectiveness of human-directed antibodies against these targets. So, right, that's another hot area of cancer research right now. Um, and here I'm showing you a, a, a panel from, from a study we did in which we combined anti-human CD20 uh, with an anti-human SERP alpha antibody uh, in, again, a Raji uh, CDX uh, system. So we have uh, the uh, uh, combination of these two individual antibodies in the background uh, targeting uh, both human CD20 uh, and human SERP alpha. And the take home here is that uh, the CD20 antibody reduces tumor burden on its own as measured indirectly through fluorescence here um, with minimal changes in body weight. But not only that, we see that the combination of this treatment with anti-human SERP alpha antibody produces the most potent anti-tumor response. Uh, so again, just a great system for studying uh, uh, therapeutics that are directed at these human targets uh, within a highly immunodeficient mouse background. That brings me to question three. Let's see here. Oh, this is my favorite one. All right, let's launch that. So the question is, which Jackson staff lab member is credited with uh, first characterizing the genetics of histocompatibility and transplantation using mouse tumors? That's a bit of a tough one. I think a lot of people will, will recognize some of these names, some, some giants in the fields of mouse genetics, and uh, let's see what you think. We got, we got majority right answers on the first two questions, so let's see. Give it a few more seconds here before we end it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end it now. All right, and we see uh, it looks like there's a tie uh, between Leonard Schultz and George Snell, uh, both very famous uh, mouse geneticists. Uh, Leonard Schultz critical to the development of many of the models that we've been talking about, but unfortunately, uh, that is not the correct answer. 
Uh, the correct answer is George Snell, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1980, Massachusetts native. Um, and uh, the, the, the critical target, you know, the reason I bring this up and, and the reason it's relevant to our discussion is, again, consideration of that beta-2 microglobulin knockout plus system. And the advantage of this is that we see reduced graft versus host disease. But if we do a head-to-head -head comparison between the BNDG mice and the BNDGs that have beta-2 microglobulin knocked out, uh, the mouse version knocked out, um, we see that the BNDG mice don't survive nearly as long as the uh, as the knockout uh, combined mice um, as a result of graft versus host disease, which again, as we've alluded to, is one of the complications of working with human cells in these systems. They may engraft very well, uh, but they may also attack other cells within within the animal. Um, and so there's a trade-off there. Um, and we we created this tool, this model system to alleviate uh, the the um, targeting of, of those murine cells um, and the enhanced graft versus host disease that limits mouse survival and therefore their utility as a, as a uh, model and research system. So that's really great. Um, okay, so that's pretty much what I've got for uh, introducing the BNDG mice. Um, and the next generation mice, which we're really excited about. In addition to these, we're working on many, many other popular uh, targets, combining the BNDG mouse with, uh, with additional humanized genes of immunological and other interest, um, as well as knocking out murine genes to see if we can better balance that, uh, that trade-off between uh, successful engraftment and reconstitution of human immune cells, um, but also uh, reducing graft versus host disease that, that limits uh, the utility or at least the longevity of these mice. So lastly, I just wanted to talk before we get to the Q&A um, about the process of ordering mice from biocytogen. Um, you all may be familiar that we have a really extensive model catalog of, of off-the-shelf humanized um, uh, mice on different backgrounds. But in addition, uh, to the models that we've talked about today, we have over 30 highly immunodeficient models um, available, and we're working on many more. 23 of those are on the BNDG background, right? So there's quite a few that we didn't have time to go into today. We'd be happy to talk about them uh, uh, later on by email or, or however you like, um, but but we're always expanding this, um, and, and we hope to have a lot more available for you in the future. Um, all of the animals uh, are bred and shipped from our 540,000 square foot specific pathogen free facility, uh, and that's in Hyman, China. So they're bred and uh, shipped directly from there to you uh, in the US or wherever else you might be. Uh, we also provide health reports and include screening for over 80 different pathogens. So, uh, you know, certainly. Uh, we are aware of the issues with customs and the complications of uh, bringing new animals into your institution or facility, and we work with you and cooperate on that to make it as easy as possible, uh, letting you know that the mice are healthy um, and, and safe to be imported into your facility. Animals are typically shipped directly to you uh, with a transit time of uh, of about one to two weeks uh, directly to you, and uh, it doesn't take very long. We've had some complications with COVID, but we're not experiencing any uh, right now. Um, and uh, lastly, I wanted to mention that the BNDG mice, uh, the parental strain is distributed through our partner in Vigo. Um, and so if you have any questions about, about that in the ordering process, we can talk about that uh, in the Q&A as well. All right, so that is what I have uh, for you. And thank you so much for your attention. Um, love to hear your questions. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Rebecca um, so that she can, um, she can take those. Thanks for the nice presentation, John. Um, looks like we have some really good questions coming in through the chat. Um, so I'll start with some that are pertaining to uh, human immune uh, reconstitution with uh, PBMCs. Um, and so the first one is, uh, are BNDG mice engrafted with PBMCs um, showing myeloid uh, population? Yeah, so I don't think I showed in the slides uh, anything that speaks specifically to that point, but we did talk already about the issue of myeloid cell uh, deficiencies uh, that are primarily caused by a uh, lack of cytokine signaling in these highly immunodeficient backgrounds. And so that's where the humanized, uh, the, the co-expression of, of, of other cytokine genes can ensure that those populations are stable and differentiate. So that would be a next generation model, but great question. Right. Yeah. And um, you've already alluded to this one as well, but, you know, if you can just kind of give some talking points on um, the graft versus host disease um, and BNDG mice reconstituted with uh, PBNCs. 
Yeah, that's right. I did show some survival curves. So you get the sense that, you know, that this is obviously, you know, and evidently a problem and a balance, a trade-off that you have to make in selecting the system. So that's really, again, why we would, um, you know, encourage the use of, for example, the beta-2 microglobulin knockout uh, second generation uh, to alleviate the effect and maybe grant you slightly longer longevity. Uh, so it's certainly an issue, um, uh, but but balancing that trade-off is made more possible through the use of these additional models. James, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Uh, not much. I think the first question, the BNDG is reconciled with PBMC, uh, myeloid lineage, uh, whatever the, the next generation of cytokine infection, human uh reconciled with PBMC will not generate uh, myeloid lineage. If you want to really focus on myeloid lineage, uh, you'd better use the uh, human stem cells, CD34 cells, to reconcile it with like R3 or ICF uh, human growth factor there. Uh, that will help a lot. Yeah, all great points. And, and kind of like how John alluded to in his talk too, that um, with human PBNC reconstitution, you mainly get T cells. So. Yes, if you want to look at myeloids, definitely use uh, CD34 positive HSCs. Um, also, in regards to um, PBNC reconstitution, um, the proportion of NK cells is um, in CD45 is very high. Can you comment on it? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's uh, out of my knowledge scope. I don't know the normal uh, the normal percentage. I think uh, if you use, uh, we have a lot of uh, clients, they order that uh, uh, BNDG R15 humorous mice. They, their study mainly focus on NK cells function. Uh, so we will uh, go back, double check uh, the, the percentage. I think that could, uh, uh, could happen because, you know, we, uh, we, we have the uh, human R15 cytokine there. And uh, because other uh, cell population uh, even uh, reconstituted, but it probably has some disadvantage to grow, that make uh, the percentage uh, a little bit uh, unbalanced, probably a little bit favorite to uh, NK cells. Uh, that could be uh, could be uh, could be the phenomenon. Uh, thank you very much to observe that. We will go back to uh, to the literature to double check that. Yes, um, and so. Uh, John had shown some um, humanized BNGD mice, and so one of the questions is, does the marine IL-6 gene um, still express in uh, humanized IL-6 BNGD mice? Um, so I can comment on that one. Um, we did replace the open reading frame of the marine IL-6 gene with um, its human counterpart, and we do have some uh, data, um, specifically ELISA, um, showing that um, we get human expression of IL-6, but we did it um, in heterozygotes. Um, and so we do also have um, marine IL-6 um, protein expression. Um, and so kind of in line with that question, um, we have another one. Um, were human cytokine mice uh, knock-in or transgenic? And was the human cytokine controlled by mouse promoter or CMV? So generally speaking, uh, we do in situ replacement of the uh, coding sequence and sometimes regulatory regions. It really depends on, um, uh, you know, the specific uh, uh, target that you're talking about, the specific gene you're talking about. But in general, uh, we would do in situ replacement of the human uh, coding sequence uh, in place of the mouse. Okay, great. So next question, uh, what is the difference uh, between BNDG mice um, versus NSG or NOG mice? Um, so that's one separate question, but uh, another question is uh, why BNDG mice lack BT uh, and NK cells? So I feel like we can answer both of those questions at the same time. Yep, sure. So um, the, the background of the BNDG mouse is a NOD skid. It's a NOD CB17 with that PRKDC uh, skid uh, uh, mutation. Um, so as a result, uh, th these animals have defective uh, VDJ recombination and cannot make uh, murine, uh, make and mature and differentiate murine T and B cells. Um, the difference between the NSG and NOG strains and the BNDG mouse is that the parental strain differs. Uh, so it's uh, NOD CB17 for the BNDG mouse and NOD uh, SHE-LTJ for the NOG and 
and NSG mice. Um, also, the NSG, there's another difference, which is that the NSG Nog mice contain a null IL-2 R gamma allele, um, whereas in BNDG mice, uh, as, as I said in the presentation, we knock it out entirely. So there's no, there's no um, for example, in the Nog mice, they can produce a IL-2 R gamma chain, but it, it, it uh, binds but does not signal. Um, and in the NSG mouse, um, uh, it, it, it cannot bind and therefore doesn't uh, uh, doesn't signal either. Um, but in this case, we just remove the whole thing um, to avoid any expression of it. That's the, that's another difference. Okay, great. Um, another question: Do any of the NDG mice models recapitulate the splenic architecture upon HSC transfer? That's a great question that I, I don't know that I've seen data directly related to it. It may be data that we possess. Um, I would have to check with our with our staff, but that's a great question. Perhaps James uh, or someone else uh, knows more than I do about that. Uh, no, I don't I don't know the, the answer. We would, we would double check that. Yeah, great question. Yes, and uh, for any of you, uh, if we're not able to answer your questions um, or you, know, you feel like you want more information, please feel free to follow up with us um, and we can definitely Give you more information afterwards. Um, but another question is, have you been able to make class switched human um, antibodies? Uh, I believe we do have the the evidence of that. I, I didn't show it and I don't have it handy on a slide, but I believe I've seen it. That's another one we'd have to follow up with. But obviously the ability uh, to promote class switching uh, uh, would be uh, would would be critical and expected actually, you know in the in the model system. Um, so I, I would say tentatively, uh, uh, yes, because I believe I've seen that data, but again, we'd have to follow up with you on that. Great question. Um, so we'll just take a few more questions um, since we are running low on time. Um, does the BNG mice have any draining lymph node? That's another one that I'm unfortunately, I'm sorry, I do not know the answer to. I, again, would, as, would assume so, um, but I, I don't want to say one way, certainly one or, or the other. But again, perhaps James knows. Uh, I think there's a lymph node, but uh, we, will, we will double check that. And also, I think that question, I, I, I don't know if we answered it very well or not. The, it's a uh, Nalkin or transgenic, we definitely, it's a uh, uh, in-situ Nalkin. So it's uh, the humans that can be driven by mouse promoter. It's not by uh, CMA or not by human promoter. It's by mouse promoter. We just uh, uh, switch the coding region. Yeah, where possible, we try to preserve the regulatory elements of the mouse so that it functions yeah. as an intact system. Uh, right, yeah, and that I think that also kind of alludes to um, a question that was raised, um, does the concentration of overexpressing human cytokines? Um, I think that answers that as well. Yeah, um, they, they're expressed at more physiological level than something like a you know crazy driven CMV promoter. Right, yes, absolutely. Um, so we'll... Uh, our last question will be, um, what is the ordering process like um, from Envigo uh, to get the NDG mice? Uh, actually, yeah, they, the, the Envigo has the uh, total right to distribute the mice in US and, uh, and Europe. Uh, I think uh, John can, uh, can share that uh, the contact information, uh, their sales director, uh, Travis, uh, we had uh, quite a uh, good uh, conversation with, with him and also have keep a good relation with him. Uh, they will also appreciate the way <coughs> we refer uh, all the inquiry, uh, inquiry to them. Uh, it will be quite the same for same as uh, Alter and other mice from Takani or Jackson. Yes, um, and if you are all interested, uh, feel free to reach out. We can provide that information. Um, otherwise, we are uh, coming to an end with this webinar. So thank you all for attending and thank you for your great uh, questions. Uh, again, feel free to use our contact us page, uh, email or phone, and we'll be happy to answer any questions and, and hopefully partner with you. So thank you all for attending. Yeah, thank you all for listening. I'm going to drop the Invigo contacts uh, email uh, in the, into the chat just momentarily. Thanks again for your attention and time. Thank you very much. Thank you.